Hi, this is Shira Rubinoff. I'm here with Insights in Tech. I'm here with Michelle Dennity. Michelle, pleasure to have you here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Shira. Oh, of course. Michelle, please introduce yourself to our audience. Give them a bit of a highlight of your incredible career, uh, what you've done and what you're doing now. Yeah, so thank you. And then thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been watching and it's so good. Um, my name's Michelle Dennity, and I started out as an attorney, so I approached data from initially the legal side of the world, but that certainly hasn't been the end of my journey. I was a patent litigator, and then I was sort of CPO to the infrastructure, first at Sun Microsystems, bought by Oracle to do sales there, then McAfee Intel after that combination, then Cisco, and now on to my own company, Drumwave Incorporated. Wonderful. So Michelle, you've obviously had a very impressive career thus far, and certainly you're gonna leave your mark going forward. You've pivoted from being the chief privacy officer in some of the most biggest recognized companies to becoming the CEO of a very exciting, successful startup. Certainly those roles call for different perspectives during this pandemic of COVID-19. So Michelle, what challenges have you faced and are facing as a CEO that you did not expect to have to deal with? Oh, wow. Um, you know, who didn't, ex you know, who expected the Spanish Inquisition, right, as Monty <laughs> Python used to say. I mean, I think we all, if we were really being careful and cautious, um, and if you are in the data world and in, in cybersecurity and privacy, you, you, that's your jam, we all knew that we were facing some sort of a recession, whether it was going to be trade triggered, health triggered, or just you know polarity triggered in some fashion. So the, the fact that we've had a retrenchment economically is no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention. The fact that everyone's digital infrastructure immediately exploded like an orange overnight so that now you're, as, as the privacy gang and the security gang have been saying for decades, your perimeter is your carbon-based unit. Exactly. No more are we living with inside the bounds of a common enterprise. And I think that's been the biggest change for everyone on the planet. Sure. And in terms of being a CEO and having wearing many different hats all of a sudden, what have you found to be the most exciting parts of it? Obviously having to deal with this whole new world. And also what are the parts that you're like, you know what, I didn't sign up for this and I have to make this work and I will, but I don't know what to, you know, tell me, what are you thinking here? Yeah, I mean, as CEO, I mean, your your main role is to be the chief advocate for your company. And in some ways, starting a, a Series A roadshow, which we are starting in lockdown, wow. not your typical jam. There's a lot less espresso that's been written than that's been drunk. And it's harder to gain new customers when you have a solution that is cross-functional, that C-level on an enterprise level, to have a, a, an online conversation and dialogue about what that might be is very different when you're not sitting face to face. That doesn't mean it's insurmountable. It means that everybody has to be incredibly tuned in and creative in, in their thought leadership and, and in the way we all just sort of, we've always rolled up our sleeves to help each other in startups. Yeah. Now you can't look over at the desk next to you and see someone is distressed. You really have to proactively reach out and lead from every single chair that you're sitting in, whether you're the CEO or you know the, the newest programmer on the block. Well, certainly. And let's talk a little bit about funding. I know every startup is worried about funding. Are there going to be sources for funding soon when I'm ready to grow my company? You know, I've done a lot of uh, conversations with venture capitalists and funders and they seem to say that there is capital for those companies that are making the mark and that are needed. You know, we bucket startups in a nice to have, good to have, or a need to have, and yours certainly fits into the need to have. Have you found any of this type of action to be a little slower than you would have been happy with? Or you find it to be, you know what, I'm in the right space and it's really not affecting me. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know, as a CEO, it's my job to be greedy. So of course it's going too slowly for me. Um, you are seeing a lot of VCs serving their early portfolios, particularly in a series A where you're, you're sort of in that weird adolescent phase. In our case, our early customers are where we were initially founded in Brazil. And so making the leap of the traction that we're making here in the US with a different selling style um, and new customers is different 
And so getting past different has been a challenge for us in particular. But I think the other part is when you have a very powerful, so we call ourselves the data value company. So I look at value in data as Grace Hopper did. Eventually it will be on the corporate balance sheet, right? 1965, our favorite hero, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. By looking at the long-term growth of data, which is one way you use a data growth platform, you're thinking something strategic, you're thinking something that could be a year to 18 months in, in you know, grand scale of business transformation. In thinking where we are today in the world of pandemic, I'm really looking at the tip of that spear, which is how do you actually assess your data today? Every company should be looking at their physical assets, their human assets, and their data assets. And so the pivot of our company and the traction has changed a little bit. Those companies that are investing now in that strategy of where is my data, what I call a digital mise en place, putting all of your digital assets, not necessarily behind your firewall because that has changed, but putting it in front of you on a registered platform with provenance, now you can do short-term survival tactics and get to that longer, how is my data actually increasing, not just my capital increase, but what we call your data cap. How is your data working for your business to drive that business forward? Well, jumping on that, you really touched upon my next question that I had for you. So we talk about security that's all about the data. You have to know your data. Where is it? Where does it sit? Who has access to it? As well as many other specifics surrounding that data. As COVID-19 has made companies scramble to shift into a remote environment, what tips can you share to us around data security? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. I'll start with scary and we'll work into positive as you and I are both optimists. <laughs> I think the scariest thing, I was reading an article this morning that if you're a cyber person or an info, infosec person, you're saying, of course, but the headline was, we, have, we will see in the next few months the biggest cyber infiltration, cyber crime breach than we've ever seen. It will make everything look like dust. And why is that? Because the way that um, we've looked at data in the past, particularly when we're talking about security without privacy and ethics engineering and privacy engineering in mind, is we, th we think that the equipment and the software is a proxy for data. And it is, it's a good guessing point, but that's not the same as data. The data is happening, you and I having a conversation right now, sharing it with the world on this platform, every single one of those conversations is a data transaction. And so if you start to look at your data as a transaction, as ephemeral as currency, you can start to manage it. And here comes the positive. Currency, if I hold up a, a, a green square and I say, what is this? You might identify it as a US dollar, but what does that mean? It means something different in Taiwan, it means something different in France, and it means something different in Silicon Valley versus Kansas, because there's a relative nature of what that thing can do for you. It's a proxy for value. So if you start to look at data as a proxy for value, and you don't despair and say, oh my gosh, I thought it was the machines. I thought it was the firewall. Oh my gosh, how do I cope? You can cope the same way we've coped with cash on the balance sheet, with looking at investment as every bit as healthy for a business as storing things in savings for a rainy day. And so think about your data in the same way. What do I need to spend in terms of data? Letting go, letting people, letting people work from home when they have to. What's your next step going to be as we figure out how we're opening up and where we're opening up? Do you think you're going to be that much safer just having people drive to your office? Or are you going to think about having a data audit, thinking about what's been effective, and then really propelling yourself forward based on data assets as data as a conversation, data as currency, and it's going to be your supply chain currency that's really going to help you fit into this new economy. Because I don't believe we're going to go backwards. I think it's going to be something new. Yeah, I think those are incredible points that you pointed out. And certainly the way you explained it is super powerful. And I couldn't agree more with you. This is not going to be going back to the old. It's going to be the future work. What is it going to look like? Some combination of both. Michelle, thank you very much for your time. And thank you for your share to our audience. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. 
Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Yara, and best of luck with the show. It looks like it's booming. Thank you.